Peace and power, everybody. It's your one and only Khonsu Sheshmo Amon. And we are back with another presentation from Team Osiris. And you know, Osiris is our solution is revealed in science. We try to use the scientific method in deciphering information and, and uh, you know, on a wide scale. Today, we're going to be talking about um, ancient Egyptian um, practices. Basically, Paranami and Leadership, a publication that was written by Osari Emotep. And the person that did an in-depth study, actually read the entire book, was a team member, Joshua Kane, who was with us live, along with Melvin Jefferson and Heru from Team Osiris. And, um, you know, I think that Joshua, again, um, has done an excellent body of investigation and peripheral journalism to really kind of bring a journalistic and investigative approach to this subject matter. So, Brother Joshua, are you there? Yes, sir. Cool, cool, man. Uh, what I'm going to do is um, turn the floor over to you, brother, and um, carry on. All right. First, uh, peace to the family, uh, peace to the, the panel, and everybody listening. Um, yeah, so... Today, yeah, it'll be a critique, a breakdown of the Sukhbidi king in ancient uh, Egyptian. Now, um, I was recommended th to read this book to get to the root of Negro Egyptian because uh, apparently the work has been done and the work is within this book. So I purchased it and I read it a couple of times and um, this is what I found. So I put it in a presentation and um, I'll be presenting it today. And um, we can just jump right into it. Um, all right, first, this is like a reference guide whenever I make a point or try to um, highlight something. I'll be using or referring to the science and pseudoscience chart to the right and the uh, an article, uh, a guide to the perplex how to identify pseudo-linguistic articles in the media. And um, again, um, I'll be referring to uh, these two most of the time when I make a, a point or try to highlight some, some methodological flaws within the suit BD. Real quick, we're going to define, define a term, proto. Uh, it is a combining form meaning first, foremost, and earliest form of when used in the formation of, a com of compound words. So whenever you see proto, uh, like proto language, that means the first of foremost of a certain language group mm -hmm. or proto culture, that means the first and foremost, the birth of a, um, a culture. So moving right along. All right, page six. Um, I already went over this in my uh, other, my first presentation. It's about uh, he used uh, what is it uh, the Black Sumerians by Hermel Hermstein, Hermstein. Uh, and page six, he refers back to this again. Um, basically trying to connect Bantu, Proto Bantu, to the Sumerians. Um, so. We already went over this, but I'm going to touch on it just a, like briefly. But yeah, so the Sumerian language is a language isolate, as you can see right here. Um, and right here, the study of Sumerian, because of the lack of known cognate tongues and because Sumerian died out thousands of years ago, it is extremely difficult to establish a reliable grammar or lexicon of the language. And that, that's number one. Number two, uh, Proto Bantu, which is the language he's trying to connect to Sumerian to prove that the Sumerians were black people. Um, Proto Bantu has, has its origins in West Africa, preferably somewhere in southern Nigeria and northern Cameroon. That's the origin. And then it, it dispersed from there, went out to Central, it went to Eastern Africa, Africa, it went uh, to the South, and basically um, encompassed most of Sub Saharan Africa. So, next slide. Um, page seven. Um, 
page seven, um, he he references this book to the left, um, an introduction to Proto Indo European and the Proto Indo European world. And he says right here, in other words, if one is trying to reconstruct the proto culture of a group of distant people, simply acknowledging and sharing cultural traits is not enough. Only by establishing a strong relationship via the languages can a real case be made for a common origin of a people a, of a group of people. But that's not necessarily what this book is saying. Um, and even like modern linguists right now, they don't just. I mean, it's it's really uh, pointless to use linguistics by itself because it's extremely hypothetical. Only when you bring in other scientific fields, uh, such as archaeology, um, anthropology, and genetics, does that proto language kind of like begins it begins to take shape or take form, and you have uh, empirical data to to back it up. But again, so what he's trying to say in, in page seven and throughout his book is that you can tie all these people together linguistically, which is false. And right here, um, even in the book, it says, um, which was written, it was written in 2006, by the way, it says, although much now appears about the relationship between DNA and language, it will remain to be seen, to be seen how appropriate these te the techniques of genetics are in unraveling linguistic phenomena. So this is back in 2006, which really, it began to take off uh, the relationship between DNA and language. And then down here, uh, she goes on to talk about the archeological record and how they use that too. So it does not stand alone linguistics. It, it's, 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 it's pointless to, to do that. It's unscientific also. So um, page 17. Indo-European and Semitic languages were formed as a result of certain language groups back migrating from India. See, that line right there, I look everywhere for a, an ancient back migration from India to the Levant and to Mesopotamia. I, I look everywhere. I couldn't find anything. And he really doesn't provide any, um, any proof to back up that claim either. So, and then you go down right here, it says these unknown languages from India converge with Negro Egyptian and thus Proto-Indo-European and Proto-Semitic reform. Like, again, like, can you give us a date, a time frame, like, having the genetic uh, data to back it up in your archaeology? And the answer is no, but he does try to, um, he does reference this article, um, page 40, it says, I suggest that the indigenous group of speakers in the Middle East were bat migrants from India into the Levant area where Semitic originated. So um, again, uh, he references the, this article, uh, the, Bay, the Bayesian phylogenetic analysis of the Semitic languages. Um, and within this article, it's, it's funny that he used it because it doesn't say anything about a bat migration from India. And also, Number one, it agrees with Afro-Asiatic, this article. Um, and the suit Beattie disagrees with Afro-Asiatic. It says that Afro-Asiatic is unscientific and false. However, he uses an article that agrees with Afro-Asiatic. And number two, this article, like I said before, doesn't say anything about a bat migration from India. And number three, it agrees with that Semitic uh, diverse from Afro-Asiatic, which he also disagrees with. So, uh, let me see, page 44. Okay, so Mboli argues that there were three ways of Negro Egyptian speakers who migrated to the Middle East at various times and does not give a time or a time frame as usual. Um, right here, it is the M dialect, Bantu prefixes, Mu, Ma, etc., of Negro Egyptian that is responsible for the formation of proto Semitic. And let me see what else. Uh, they found a wave out of Africa that imposed itself simultaneously on both linguistic substrate, which were already had already heavily influenced by previous beer wave uh, proto-Semitic for those headed towards the Levant and occupying all of Arabia and proto-Indo-European for those who continue to advance towards the north. So again, so what he's saying right here, um, if you look at the globe, 
He's saying that Negro Egyptian speakers. I, he doesn't give a homeland either. So I, I, I assume it's Egypt. So they migrated out. They gave birth to Proto-Semitic. And the ones that kept traveling north gave birth to Proto-Indo-European. And this is what he's saying. Does he provide anything to back it up? No, he does not. Tries to use linguistics. Thing. He tries to use the Bantu language as the, the progenitor of Proto-Semitic. So when you talk about Bantu people, again, um, the origin is in, in West Africa, not Chicago um, area. And that's, uh, that's Proto-Bantu. And then once they started to migrate within uh, the Congo and they spread out throughout all of, well, most of uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. So they were nowhere near uh, the Mideast. So I don't know how they gave uh, rise to Proto-Semitic when they're thousands, thousands of miles apart. So again, this is why you just can't use linguistics by itself. Page 45. Um, okay, so on this page, he references uh, Um, right here. At a minimum, we know of two ways of Negro Egyptian speakers uh, who were speaking different varieties of the same language. This is corroborated at least archaeologically in the historical record. So he references this article um, on National Geographic by Sorkita, and he goes on to talk about um, what well, Sorkita says in his article, um, he talks about the various out of Africa migrations, um, talks about the Holocene period, the Green Sahara period within the Nile uh, in Egypt. Then um, he talks about uh, uh, the rock paint, paintings and, um, and other migrations. But still, though, the way he's using it is uh, out, of, out of context. Because I still don't know what time frame he's talking about. Like, it can be last year, it can be a thousand years ago, you know. So, if we go on to the next page, okay, so he took from Sorkita, and Sorkita is the last uh, person a Afrocentric would wanna, want to uh, reference because Sorkita does not subscribe to it, the Afrocentric model of, of Egypt being all black and also. Like right underneath uh, the um, on the same page that he referenced, um, Sorkita talks about uh, ancient Egyptian language, and he says ancient Egyptian with Coptic forms one branch within the Afro Afroasiatic uh, linguistic phylum. So right off the, off, the, off the top, like he agrees with ancient Egyptian being a part of the Afroasiatic linguistic uh, phylum, and he agrees that. Uh, Coptic uh, is part of uh, the Egyptian language. So that contradicts the Subedi stance that Coptic is not a part of ancient Egyptian and that ancient Egyptian is part of Afro-Asiatic because he does not agree with Afro-Asiatic and Egyptian being Afro-Asiatic. So it's called, you know, again at the top, you see it's, it's called cherry picking and only picking favorable evidence and once you look you cross examine his references you see that he just cherry picks here and there and totally ignoring the inconsistencies and the contradictions in his sources and you'll see that time and time again and then okay so no archaeology used you'll see without this throughout this book except this excerpt from Sorkita and again, like I mentioned, it doesn't um, line up chronologically with what he's saying. And so, like I said, Sorkita does not uh, subscribe to that Black Egyptian hypothesis. And you see right here on page five in the suit meeting, it says the first assumption is the that the um, ancient that ancient Kemet was an African country. Its inhabitants were Black African people. It's page five. So, if you reference Sorkita, you would know that he does not. Uh, Subscribe to that. And again, on that same article that he referenced earlier, right here, human biology, and uh, he says that the basic overall genetic profile of the modern population is consistent with the diversity of the ancient populations that would have been indigenous to Northeastern Africa and subject to the range of evolutionary influences over time. So again, he does not agree with that. Um, they came from the South, uh, Black Egyptian hypothesis. 
at all. So, oh yeah. So again, that's another thing that uh, uh, that's practiced within pseudoscience is that they start with a conclusion, i.e., the uh, black Egyptians, and they work backwards to confirm it. So yeah, so again, this is something or what uh, Sorkita was highlighting. I use another article, um, Climate Control, Holocene Occupation in the Sahara, the motive of Africa's evolution. It talks about the various um, settlements, the uh, time periods, the dry Sahara, the green Sahara, and when the Sahara began to dry up, and then um, the pre-dynastic time in, in, um, in Egypt. So. All right, so page 45. Middle Egyptian and Coptic are two separate languages that have mutually influenced each other in the land of Kemet. So, all right, a number of things wrong with this. He's saying that, what he's saying is clearly that Coptic, um, Coptic or Cops uh, were speaking the same well, at the same time as Middle Egyptian. So you see right here, Middle Egyptian is 2000 BC. Uh, we're spoken, uh, you know, roughly 2000 BC to 1350 BC. And Coptic is, is you know, after the Greeks invaded. So that's those are like thousands of years apart. So what he's saying is that, I guess he thinks that Coptic and Middle Egyptian were spoken at the same time. That That's just false. Like, that's a elementary mistake to think that these two were speaking at the same time and influenced each other like how is that even possible like so how did coptic go back in time and influence middle egyptian if they are for, for them to mutually influence each other like that makes no sense i still don't understand what he's trying to say so and he said they they are to, two totally separate different languages he's not even saying that Coptic is the last stage. He doesn't believe that Coptic is the last stage. He thinks it's just a totally separate language altogether. So I use the the Sanu uh, papyrus, um, like dated to the, the Middle Kingdom. It's probably like, it's considered one of the most famous texts from um, from ancient Egypt. Um, they have copies from the 12th dynasty and they have one from the, from the 19th dynasty. Um, so we'll be looking at some words within the Sanu papyrus. And right here uh, on the left, um, these are Middle Egyptian words, according to, I want to say James P. Allen. And to the right are Coptic words. And you see right here a continuation of certain words like meat, um, which is pronounced off. And then you go to the right and you see the Coptic word and you see cognates within Middle Egyptian spoken from roughly 2000 to 1300, no, 1350 BCE, all the way into Coptic, uh, like a nuke and a nuke. And you got a uh, Abu, which is the word for elephantine. And then you got Abu over here in Coptic. And I'm pulling these Coptic terms from the Coptic Dictionary and the Coptic etym Etymological uh, Dictionary also. So again, um, once you analyze like the, the calendar from the 19th Dynasty, and then I got a Coptic uh, correspondence, and you still see a, a, a continuation with the calendar itself. And um, so yeah, so I, I pulled, those words and the and that calendar from um this this uh this book right here uh Egyptian phonology and introduction to the phonology of a dead language and um so how is Coptic a separate totally separate language was what he's saying in Kemet when with one papyrus and uh the Sanu papyrus uh you find 88 cognates between uh Middle Egyptian and Coptic so that's false. Um, all right, so page 49, he talks about, he pulls from uh, African languages and introduction. Um, he talks about proto-language does not give birth to its daughters and remain distinct from them. It evolves directly into each of its daughters as part of a continuing historical process. It becomes its daughters. Um, 
So yeah, that's gonna be important when we go uh, go forward throughout the presentation. Uh, let me see. Okay, so page four to six. Uh, it it is observations like this that help in the assumption of a continuity between the languages middle the languages of Middle Egyptian and Coptic. When in fact, we, as we argue, it is a result of existing relatively peacefully, re relatively peacefully in a um confluence zone, which facilitated synthesizing of culture and shared linguistic features, enough to make researchers think that Coptic is the last stage of Egyptian. However, something must have happened to interrupt this peaceful, uh, this peace, I, I guess, as suggested by the Norma palette. So what he's saying right here is that he thinks that uh, the, the entire Egypt uh, Egyptological schools have gotten it wrong about Coptic being the last stage of Egyptian. He's saying that nope, Coptic and uh, Middle Egyptian were spoken at the same time. That's what really happened. And Middle Egyptian is indigenous to Egypt, and Coptic is foreign. So that's what he's trying to say. And he does again. He does not agree that Coptic is the last stage. Clearly, that. That they were spoken at the same time, and that's why you see similarities, which is just totally false and just ridiculous. So, all right, page forty-seven. Uh, hey, brother Melvin, you, you there? <laughs> uh, yes, sir. I'm here. I'm here. All right, cool. Uh, remember, we talked about this. Uh, <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, page 47. Thereafter, Manitho tells also of five Egyptian tribes which formed 30 dynasties comprising those whom they call gods, demigods, spirits of the dead, and mortal men. Thus, from the historical record, we, we know of at least five tribes that came together to form political chemistry. So right now, he, he's using Manitho as historical evidence and proof that there are five, well, multiple uh, languages uh within uh Egypt starting from pre-dynastic times all the way up into um modern times this is what he's using Manitho like I mean so what what do y'all think about using Manitho to prove that I think from an academic standpoint using Manitho isn't necessarily wise that you know there is no actual proof, you know, of him. And, you know, most people that use him use him for a biblical sense. And so they can kind of get away with it, you know, in the Hebrews or some Christians who use Manito. But when you're trying to show tribes, uh, real living people, I would not use Manito uh, to prove Egyptian tribes. I would definitely look for a different source. I would definitely try to look for some indigenous tribes. Uh, archaeology is a great resource for that if they're no longer living and if they are living then definitely going there to the continent and actually putting in the preliminary research with those tribes is what's highly recommended that that's going to be primary resource I would, yeah, we, I would also like to add um, that with Manitho classically um, scholars really only use the chronological aspects that Melito uses in regards to um, history. Um, and really, it only was adopted by Flavius Josephus that kind of pushed the use of Melito as a primary source. And it was just agreed upon. It never was actually really challenged because a lot of Melito's work is missing. So, but I digress. Yeah. Yeah. And even with that, like he clearly, he, he's talking about gods, demigods, spirits of the dead, <laughs> and mortal men. And I guess Asari Motep is equating that to actual tribes. I mean, I don't know. I, me personally, I wouldn't use it to substantiate uh, five different tribes. And see, the problem, uh, Brother Melvin, that you said uh, with going over there and to Egypt and doing primary research, he does not he does not think that the current population is the original population. So, um, I, I'm guessing because of skin color, 
but moving right along. Uh, oh yeah, so I thought I'd just throw this in here. Um, yeah, uh, they were they were giants upon earth by Zachariah Sitchin. He also uses beneath those guys and demon guys out of context in his book. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, and there were giants upon earth is also listed at Harvard and Yale if you want to check it out. Um, let me see. All right, going to the next one. That's just yeah, cherry picking favorable evidence and relies on testimonials or weak evidence. Again, case in point. All right, so page forty-eight. Here he makes up his own definitions. Um, while I do not discount dialects in ancient Egypt, it is my contention that the temporal dialects were in fact separate languages. And then he references himself three times as 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 was earlier argued by emboldening when vocabulary and grammar are different it is not the case of dialect but of a one of a different language so you go right here i pull it from linguistics the introduction um i just pulled a simple definition dialect a distinct form of a language that differs from the other forms of that language and specific linguistic features Pronunciation, vocabulary, and grammar possibly associated with some regional, social, or ethnic group, but never, nevertheless, they are mutually intelligible with them. That that's the definition of a dialect. So, right here, this saying is okay. A dialect uh, is distinct form of a language. You know, what I'm saying they're still mutually intelligible, although they have different forms of pronunciation. Uh, vocabulary and grammar. Nevertheless, nevertheless, they're still uh, dialect. But up here, he's saying that no, if uh, when grammar and vocabulary are different, it is not not the case of dialect, but a different language altogether. So, yeah, that's flawed methods. Um, you got uh, conflating concepts and misrepresenting theories. So much going on right there. Going ahead to the next one. I think I got that in the twice. Let's move on. All right. So page 50, what do we take from the citation? It is clear that Middle Egyptian language existed side by side with the New Kingdom. And during the New Kingdom, the scribes were still speaking Middle Egyptian, including it in the New Kingdom. He's, 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 he's right. But uh, again, he pulls from a source that does not agree with nothing he's saying in this book. Like, and he just cherry picked a favorable source to make a point. But when you put further review, this, this author, uh, not only does he agree with the genetic unity of Afro-Asiatic, Egyptian within Afro-Asiatic, he also agrees that Coptic is the last stage of the Egyptian language. Nothing about Bantu and Egyptian in his book, so, you know, why use it? Like, um, right here, he talks about the evidence provided by Coptic, and he talks about how Coptic was necessary to use because of the lack of vowels in the previous stages of Egyptian. and and it was hard to detect dialects in the earlier stages, but Coptic allowed um, researchers to kind of uh, kind of suggest that yeah, there were dialects in the earlier stages. Just don't know how many or where, but they just guessed. Anyway, long story uh, short, using another scholar that did, totally disagrees with your whole entire premise and cherry picking just one favorable. Um, line that you like all right page 51 all right so he's saying he's saying that it had to be another language altogether this means that these languages were being spoken at the same time and they did not evolve from each other so again historically he's saying that uh oh yeah wait i'm going on right here also dialect dialectical distinctions are generally in, invisible in pre um he says morphological and grammatical features, however, indicate that old and late Egyptian are historical phases of a single dialect and are closely related one, probably one of, from the north, while Middle Egyptian represents a separate dialect with uh, most likely a southern uh, southern or origin. So, so yeah, he pulled from James P. Allen, but he didn't read like um, yo. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the relationship between these various stages of Egyptian is not strictly diachronic in nature. Coptic shows evidence of six major dialects 
and numerous sub dialects, and these undoubtedly existed in some form in the early stages of the language. So it's kind of like how he chopped it up. He tried to say that these languages on page 51 are totally different and they did not evolve from each other. And then he pulled from a source in James B. Allen, and then it does say that they evolved from each other and they are dialects. So again, that's cherry picking. And then again, like he thinks that old Egyptian, middle Egyptian, late Egyptian, and Coptic were spoken at the same exact time. Like you had Coptic speaking people, I guess. You had late Egyptian speaking people, middle Egyptian speaking people, and old Egyptian speaking people talking at the same time. And that's where the similarities arise in Coptic, according to him. So still. All right. All right, we already noted that. All right, we already noted that the similarities were due to borrowings, borrowings as a result of convergence. He's saying again that these separate languages, uh, in particular, uh, Coptic, which confuses the historical picture. He's saying that everybody's confused about history. Allen notes how drastically different Middle Egyptian is from New Kingdom and has to admit that Middle Egyptian interrupts this notion that there was a straight evolutionary path from Old Kingdom, Old Kingdom to New Kingdom to Coptic. All right, so like first of all, like nobody says that it was a straight evolutionary path from Old Kingdom to New Kingdom to Coptic. I mean, Egyptian history doesn't have a, a straight uh, evolutionary path. They had uh, interactions with various groups, invasions they had to deal with. So no, no one says that it's, it's a straight uh, evolutionary path. And uh, page 51, continue. All right, here he says, get my, all right, so right here he says that, I'm going to move side away. All right, uh, most grammar books acknowledge, which thing out of the way, most grammar books, however, Acknowledge that Old Kingdom and Middle Kingdom Egyptian are closer together and more similar than New Kingdom language. Allen, 2013, is the only text, to my knowledge, that says otherwise, man. All right, so you go to page two on Jane. I ain't have to look for it, by the way, but page two on his um, in his book, he says that ancient Egyptian is commonly divided in five historical stages um, known as Old, Middle, Late, Egyptian, Demotic, um, and Coptic. Significant differences in grammar separate the first two, meaning old and middle, from the from the uh, last three, which is late Egyptian, Demotic, and Coptic, so that these stages can be grouped into two major historical phases, designated as, as Egyptian one and Egyptian two. Um, let me see. So I mean, basically, he didn't say he didn't. He actually agrees with right here. He agrees that uh, old and middle Egyptian are closer together and more similar than the New Kingdom. He didn't say otherwise, although he did talk about dialects with uh, within his text, but that was based on Coptic and um, some other aspects of uh, middle Egyptian and, and uh, late Egyptian. But no, he didn't say that. Uh, he, he he never said that, and you can see right here on page one on four. Um, Egyptian went underwent a shift in verbal system. Egyptian one, which is old and middle, comprised right here of uh, prize of old and middle Egyptian and Egyptian two, consisting of modern Coptic. Within these elements, and the verbs are relatively linear. These are discussed. Uh, again, uh, this is a conflating concepts and misrepresenting theories. So, all right, the severe shift in, is a result of Middle e, Middle and New Kingdom Egyptian actually being two different languages, and boldly clarifies why Coptic and Middle Egyptian are so drast drastically different. All right, so not one scholar cited in the suit uh, BD says that. Middle and New Kingdom, uh, which is late Egyptian, are two different languages. Nobody else says that. Matter of fact, they don't say it's different at all. They just say it's 
uh, different stages of the same language. You know what I'm saying? Like, like why he's trying to push this point where uh, this point of these are different separate languages. Um, mainly because he thinks that if you from, remember from the earlier slides is that uh, he thinks that old Egyptian was a language spoken at the same time as middle, spoken at the same time as late Egyptian, spoken at the same time as Demotic and Coptic. So he thinks that these five different phases were spoken at the same time. So that, that just, that, that's just being completely ignorant to, to or if the stages were spoken at the same exact time. So, page 51, 52, he pulls from Helsmut Satsinger, uh, the Egyptian connection, uh, Egyptian and Semitic languages, and he says, although trying to make a case for a strong Semitic and Egyptian connection, provide these comments, uh, provide these comments that reaffirm much of what we're saying right here. So, real quick, like, he constantly pulls from sources that just completely contradicts his stance. He tries to preface it by saying, okay, he's saying this, but, you know, just ignore that. But this is what we focus on right here. Like, it's just so much cherry picking going on throughout this whole book. It just, it's, it's a crime shame. So, but you go down here, um, he had a footnote that said, we have to keep in mind, regardless of the amount of literature making this claim, Semitic and the Egyptian languages are not closely related. This is done in literature to make it appear as if the Semitic world had anything to do with, with the development of, of ancient Kemetic civilization. So, all right, so this, uh, that contradicted within the same book on page 17. Uh, he says that the Negro Egyptian speakers who migrated out of Africa in these regions um, um, gave birth to proto inner European and proto Semitic. So, pro, you know, again, the, 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 uh, the word proto means first and foremost, and then you got Semitic. He's saying Negro Egyptian, uh, which comprises of Egyptian language, Bantu, and uh, like almost every other language in Africa, he's saying that gave birth to proto Semitic. At page 40, the early Semites were just Africans, just Africans arriving in the Levant to find a lot of other people already there. However, these Africans were not Semites, but Negro Egyptian speakers for the Nile Valley as they became Semites through convergence process in the Levant. Again, he's saying that these uh, Africans that left the Nile Valley went to the Levant and became Semites later on. But again, Egyptian and Semitic is not closely related. I, just, I don't understand it, so page 44. He said that it is the M dialect, Bantu prefixes uh, of Negro Egyptian that is responsible for the formation of Proto-Semitic. So basically what he's saying right here is that Negro Egyptian speakers gave birth to Proto-Semitic, gave birth to Semitic speakers, but they're not closely related. That's just like saying grandmother gave birth to daughter and granddaughter is not closely related. Like it just... Doesn't make any sense at all. This is it, look inconsistent, cherry picking, and using flawed methods. Uh, and then to say that again, that you know, Bantu prefixes gave birth to proto semitic like Bantu was way in uh, West Africa or Sub Saharan Africa, like uh, proto semitic which they don't have a uh, actual homeland, uh, still though probably spoken somewhere the Arabian Peninsula or in the Levant somewhere. Um, still though, it, they, they are worlds apart. So, and then he, he quoted this in, the, in this book also on page 49 is that the most important thing, important insight we discovered is that the mother language diverges into its daughters just as a microscopic mother cell uh, in biology splits in its own daughters. The proto language does not give birth to its daughters and remain distinct from them. It evolves directly into each of its daughters as a, a part of a continuing historical process. It becomes its daughters. So, again, like I just don't understand how Semitic and Egyptian are not closely related. But then, Negro Egyptian, which comprises of uh, 
Egyptian gave birth to proto semitic but they're not closely related, so it doesn't make any sense. Uh, check out. So, Sumerian and Bantu are not related. I'm oh, excuse me, Sumerian and Bantu are related, but you got a uh, Egyptian and Semitic right beside each other. They're not related. And then on page eight and on uh, page nine, he says, uh, "With all the comparative work, one must caution against drawing unnecessary conclusions concerning." Relationships between cultures that exist in far-reaching geographical spaces in vastly different time periods. We must not confuse relationship with parallels and parallel with origins. I mean, let's just look at that real quick. Cultures that exist in far-reaching geographical spaces. I mean, if that's not a reach. This is the place where Bantu has spoken at right now. And this is where Sumerian is, way over here. So this is this is plausible according to him, using his logic. But Egyptian and Semitic right beside each other, and they interacted with each other historically, but they're not closely related. So okay. So again, he pulls from a uh, Helmut Satzinger on page fifty-three. He says to comment on the latter part of this citation, Satzinger is noting the various pools of cultures from which derived the Pharaonic Egyptian culture. He is admitting to the fact the area context shaped language. And he also attested at least one other language in the Delta region. So we go over here to what he actually said. He said the valley pop population is not indigenous. Uh, he has m immigrated there from either the South or the Southwest. Um, and he's, he goes on to talk about how the Egyptians may have had contact before he entered light, the light of history. May have had. And he talks about different neighbors, Cushitic, uh, Sudanic uh, languages, Nile Sahara, uh, Cordophonian languages. And, but he said these assumptions are, of course, based on present distribution. He didn't say anything was a fact. And he also did not say that various pools of cultures from which derived the Pharaonic Egyptian culture. He didn't say anything about that. He was just saying that they they may have had contact before a lot of history. And again, these assumptions are based on the current distribution. So again, he's trying. And, and that's real important, Brother Joshua, that uh, you make that distinction because we talk about critical reading and things that can be taken out of context just with a couple of words that are changed. Especially when you're quoting mm -hmm. somebody, you want to have integrity when doing it because um, it can paint a totally different picture when someone says possibly, probably, may, instead of the word fact. Because again, Correct. when we're doing research, we have to be very careful how we word things. Uh, but go ahead, brother. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. Correct. Like, uh, if I was writing a, a, um, a research paper, uh, for my professor in college, and if I twisted the words of my source, just best believe that my professor would deduct some points um, off of my paper for misrepresenting an author or misquoting him. Obviously. So, moving right along. Um, all right, so uh, this book, all right, page 53 is the Egypt was. African society it is also the opinion of linguists from Ghana, Dr. Anchi uh, In his book, The Arab Bible, as concerns to the Egyptology on the Egyptian language uh, question, he states uh, on 149 in this, in this book, which I have the book I read a couple of years ago. Um, that Chuck Polion's decipherment of the hieroglyphs was based upon the wrong premise that ancient Egypt, Egypt was a monolingual nation, as most European nations are today, which I, I just, basically saying that Champollion was false. Everything that uh, Champollion did was, I guess, false, according to Africans who wrote the Bible. All right, so let's, let's just analyze the source of which um, the Sudbidi is pulling from. So, uh, so th this book, how credible is Africans that wrote the Bible? 
check this out. So on page 63, um, and I quote, the latest evidence confirming that Moses was not a Jew, but a, an Egyptian came in 1998. In December 1998, Disney released a full length cartoon uh, feature of the life of Moses. The title of this feature was The Prince of Egypt. The uh, question is, if Moses were a Jew, could, could uh, how could he have been an ancient Egyptian prince? And that's page 63. So basically, he's using the Disney movie to prove his, his point. Um, let me see. Like, throughout the book, he, he, right. Yeah, right. How, how ridiculous is that? Um, he did not make any linguistic comparisons to biblical Hebrew or Aramaic um, and the con. Only, like, English. <laughs> he used, like, English and the con. And did a, a lot of what you call look-alike uh, linguistics or false cognates. Hey, they look alike and they sound alike. Hey, they're related, which is a lot what the suit Beatty does too. So, um, all right. So look, page fifty-one. He references a magic show on TV where a magician mentions the origin of magic was in Egypt, which bolsters his claim that Egypt started all concepts of religion. Uh, he claims to use genetic evidence to prove that the Jews slash Hebrews were Black Akan Afrim, but uses a brief he uses a briefly referenced uh, study on the limbo that he read in the New York Times. He also says that there is biblical, historical, linguistic, and cultural evidence to confirm that the classical Hebrew, that classical Hebrew was the Akan language, page 103. He rarely cites any type of source. Uh, he makes extraordinary claims with underwhelming evidence. He calls Joseph the prime minister of Egypt. He says, that Abraham went to Egypt to join the priesthood. Um, it's extremely Afrocentric. Uh, for example, like black Egyptians, black everything. And I mean, it's, it's this is a ridiculous book. This is constant. Would you use this book as a reference point to uh, to build your art? No. And you know the reason being is because. There is no proof of, there's no scientific method here. It's conjecture. That's simple. Correct. <laughs> there is no, there is no evidence here. Correct. So. There's yeah. none at all. And within his, throughout his book, he uses circular reasoning. It's like, okay, how are the Akan Hebrews? He says, the Akan are Hebrews. And I'm going to prove that the Akan are Hebrews. Then he says, the Akan are Hebrews. And I just proved that they're kind of Hebrews. That's basically what he did throughout the whole book. Like it was, it was a, it was a bad book. Um, and this is a, a, a sorry motel source. So that lets you know about credible it is. Moving right along. Yeah, sourcing is um, very look. important, man. Sourcing, very, very important. Oh yeah, you should you should always cross examine your sources. Uh, who who what you know who was it by? Uh, the date of the source, um, uh, you know, and you, you should uh, cross-examine it, like I said. Um, and and he does use outdated information, too, which is a no-no, unless this is, like, the only work within the field. But when you have, like, ancient Egypt, it's so much work that's, that's, um, that's current on ancient Egypt. You should be using those type of sources, not Africans who wrote the Bible, like, but going on, all right, page 54. This is important to note because the character, the character of the writing script is not Semitic with Negro Egyptian as noted by Diop uh, in regards to the beginning of the Metanetta script. Like no one, correct me if I'm wrong, but no one ever said that currently, nobody ever said that the, the, um, the hieroglyphs were a Semitic script. <laughs> like, I'm trying to figure out who said it. I look for people currently that say that stuff. Now, if, is it a is it an outdated argument? It might be like the 1800s, maybe you know early 1900s. But nobody currently says that the hieroglyphs are a Semitic script. Like, no, no. Yeah. So again, look, a guy to the perplex how to identify pseudo linguistic articles or pseudo linguists conflating and conflating concepts and misrepresenting theories. 
All right, so this right here is interesting. Uh, remember now, he does not agree with the Proto Bantu being in West Africa. Mm-hmm. So on page six, so on page sixty one, he references a text called uh, "In Daba, My Children: African Folk Tales." Um, so page sixty one in this text, "In Daba, My Children," Mutwa uh, argues that Bantu speakers in Cameroon have preserved the old Bantu speech. And it's it is the language that the Amazulu used to speak to the spirit world. So <sighs> old Bantu speech. Let's let's see what the old Bantu speech is. The where is this old land where the old tribes are still found today? Yep. So again, where is this old land, the old tribes? It says this is in the southern parts of the land of the Ibo and Oya in Nigeria. And it goes to name the tribes. Um, are the oldest Bantu tribes in the south. Um, it's, all these tribes are direct offshoots of the great Bantu nation that lived in the old land uh, 4,500 years ago. Uh, it's also about the Bamalik of the Cameroon. So, uh, this book is referencing Proto Bantu and Cameroon and Nigeria. Let's see right here. Nigeria, the old Bantu speech. So he doesn't agree with Proto Bantu being in West Africa, but he uses a reference, a book, a source um, that uses Proto Bantu um, to uh, West Africa. So it's just like, what's the point? So you don't agree with it, but I mean, you look, Musawa argues that the Bantu speakers in Cameroon have preserved the old Bantu speech, but you disagree with all this right here. <laughs> Very little evidence that Bantu came from Cameroon makes no sense. That's what he says right here. Uh, but the East Africa is stronger, but all this evidence, and then use a, a reference that says otherwise. All right, so Pace. Hey, uh, this is your favorite book right here, uh, Kansu. Um, yes, sir. George and Giant Stolen Legs. First eye um, opening book. <laughs> yes, sir. One of my favorites. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, uh, it's, it's outdated. Outdated. <laughs> yeah. Um, he argues that Egyptians had a secret language called Sinzar, although this language seems to be from the imagination of H.P. Blavatsky in her text, The Secret Doctrine. And it's associated with occultism. The idea of a secret or priestly language among the Egyptians may not be too far off base. Like, okay, so he he basically admitted that it's from the imagination of Helen Blavatsky. Mm-hmm. But still try to say, okay, it may still be possible. Like, bro, like, like really? <laughs> you you really trying to push uh I don't know what agenda you have or whatever, but you're using Helen Blavatsky through Stolen Legacy, and you're still trying to substantiate it when you just and admitted that. And that's actually, from the and actually to show them the, 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 how can I say? I want to say inferiority, or maybe I can even say the, um, I guess, a rookie mistake. Um, Stolen Legacy, as you see when you read the excerpt, he has pulled it from C.H. Vail, which is the ancient mysteries. Him, he himself was not quoting Blavatsky. Um, George G.M. James was heavy Masonic um, understanding. Mm. Very interesting. This is a horrible source, and then to try to say it seems to come to be from the imagination of, of Helen H.P. Uh, well, Helen Blavatsky. And to turn around and say, well, it might not to be too far off base. It just shows how desperate you are to prove your point. Yeah. Um, yeah. If you ask me. So, so like inventing knowledge, false history, fake science and religion, or well, pseudo religions. Um, it talks about uh, Blavatsky making this stuff up. And of course, you got it from uh, someone else. But again, like it just. It, it, it's a reach altogether. 
Mm -hmm. Claiming to have used sources, Madame Blavatsky described how the world will go through seven eras. Um, each of these root races, blah blah blah. Like it just, um, she basically made it all ridiculous. Page sixty-two. Um, it is already understood that the session made was was the script used by the priests, while the, the motive was primarily used by the people. All right, so. From Visual and Written Culture in Ancient Egypt by John Baines, right here, Table 1, it talks about different forms of writing, hieroglyphic, cursive, hieroglyphic, hieratic, and demotic. And right here, it talks about how they were used by the priests. So, again, the priests, not only did they use the hieroglyphic, they also used cursive, hieroglyphic, hieratic. And uh, in the, the Greco-Roman period, they used hieroglyphic, demotic, uh, and various other uh, scripts. So, and then he tried to, okay, so next page, he tried to say that um, the demotic script was primarily used by the people, but the people, the 99% were illiterate completely. Like they had no use to, to write. They had no need to write. They were craftsmen, farmers, unskilled workers, peasants, things of that nature. So I don't know what he means by the demoted was primarily used by the people because the people could not read or write. And most of the time when they needed somebody to write, they would go to one of these higher ups, scribes or whatever, and they would pay them to write documents for them. But no, the people did not use demotic. Ridiculous. All right, let me see. Um, okay, so. He pulls from this website um, at the bottom, h uh, copsy.org language. And some scholars hold that ancient Egyptians had another language in addition to written form. Father Shinoda may have summarized an opinion um, concerning the language of Egypt. And he says that uh, he emphasizes that Egyptian and Copsi language have been spoken together simultaneously since olden times. Uh, Egyptian language is not a spoken language so far, but basically derived from Coptic. So this is what um, this means that Egyptian language is is the language who who ain't language of the Egyptian who spoke in Coptic and used it for language and scriptural purposes. This Egyptian language was only known to scribes and totally unknown to the public. So he tried to use this to substantiate his claims, but on that very same website, if you read the whole entire website. Um, the author of the website went on to say about that, that in any case, the Coptic language is at base a dialect of e ancient Egyptian. Many of the nouns and verbs found in hieroglyphic texts remain unchanged in Coptic. And he said, uh, this, the author said also that it's difficult to accept the Egyptian language is basically derived from Coptic. Assuming that Coptic is the origin, more usually Coptic is considered a continuation of ancient Egyptian language, but written with a Greek and demoted alphabets by the third century AD. So uh, on this very same website, um, the author was basically going over the different hypotheses or theories regarding Coptic and Egyptian, and he just highlighted uh, one. And if you, like I said, if you read it on down, he disagreed with what this guy said, Father Shinoda Meher. But the suit Didi, um, it used Father Shinoda Meher to substantiate its claims that Coptic and Egyptian were two so totally separate languages. And so on the very same website, ancient Egyptian evolved in various stages. Um, according to Subidi, it didn't evolve. Um, let me see, uh, let me see. What's some other stuff? But yeah, that, that's pretty much it. Like, he just, he didn't read the whole entire article. Just terribly what was favorable. Page 63. Okay, he, he goes to try to explain some migrations, but we can summarize that middle Egyptian speakers invaded from Sudan um, and took control of the areas around the Delta where New Kingdom and Coptic speakers were originally settled. As a, as a result of the invasion, the language of prestige became Old Kingdom and Middle Egyptian. And it ultimately confused the situation for later researchers that gave the belief that Coptic it was the last stage of a language continuum beginning 
in the old kingdom. So again, he's this is what he's saying. Like I, he's saying that Middle Egyptian came from the south, where late Egyptian and Coptic, and I guess old kingdom was was being spoken, and Middle Egyptian took over, which is like if you just look at the chronology I got right here to the left, like that just completely insane. And then he doesn't even mention demotic. So it, it just doesn't make any sense to me. And now page 63, you kind of see why he does not like the uh the cops or or the Coptic language. Uh so what probably happened is that after the end of the Middle Kingdom, the second intermediate period, the indigenous population gained their independence and the New Kingdom and Coptic languages became became languages of administration and writing. The Coptic language may actually be a dialect of New Kingdom, was adapted by a foreign population that settled in Kemet. When we look at the appearance of the Copts today, they do not at all resemble that of the artwork of the Rima II from earlier periods. So basically, skin color. There, the Coptics are, well, the cops are not dark enough, I guess, since they don't resemble the artwork of the Rima II from earlier period. So let me see, page 63, continue. This would explain why the cops needed to, one, adopt the Greek writing script, have vowels represented in their length, in their writings. Um, it says the, the Kima II are known for creating over 800 symbols to represent their language. They are more than capable of creating additional signs for vowels. They did not have to borrow signs from a foreign people to write their ancestral language. And actually, although pre coptic Egyptian scripts are predominantly phonetic and only partially audiographic, their usability for many kinds of linguistic research is hampered by the fact they are, they, they are almost exclusively consonantal. So in his book, he's saying that the Egyptians were able to create 800 symbols representing a language. They are more than capable to creating additional signs for vowels, and that's just not what happened. That's that's not historically accurate at all. Um, and then right here is my contention that the adoption of Greek signs is because the cops partially, well, partly originated and and or identified with people from the regions of the Aegean and Mesopotamia, and vowels were critical to the understanding of the speech for which the original syllabary um, of Chikam would not have been adequate. Cop lacks the influence found in uh, Cops lack the influence found in Egyptians from Qatar and an Arabic population. It may suggest that the Cops have genetic composition that would resemble the ancestral Egyptian population without the present strong Arab influence. And this is from the genetics of African population, a uh, not also hiring component of African genetic landscape, is basically saying that the, the present uh, cops um, have the same genetic composition as the ancestral Egyptian population. So he says one thing, but in actuality, in uh, we deal with uh, scholarship, they say something totally different. So. And then on top of that, he doesn't really like really substantiate his claims. He just says things doesn't really use any strong evidence to back it up. So uh, again, page 63, he tries to say that Hebrews, um, Hebrews and Hippero is the same thing, and that's just a rookie mistake. Uh, right here, pulling from pomegranates and golden bells, studies in biblical and Jewish Near Eastern ritual law and literature. There's no validity to the assumption that the original was a peer uh, from the state of form. In short, the plethora of attempts to find some way to relate a peer rule to the gentilic um, Ibri are all nothing but wishful thinking. So, I mean, that that's just that's basic research to know that a piru and Hebrew is not the same. All right, I'm not skipping. Anything. All right, so page eighty six. 
again, he using uh, proto bantu, which he uses like 30 times when he disagrees with it. Um, the association between the tree and person can be further observed in these bantu reconstructions from the Bantu Lesco Reconstruction uh, 3 database. And again, when you use this, you basically agreeing with with this. And this is the this is the classifications of the Bantu um, linguistic uh, zones. So, pulling from historical link linguistics, it says um, they uh, Bantu languages they are likely to go back to Proto Bantu, um, taking into account the gen genetically more diverse northwestern area of Bantu zones A, B, and C. That's where Proto Bantu is hypothesized to originate at. So whenever he uses Proto Bantu in these uh, groups, A, E, F, G, he's agreeing with the current um, the current scholarship regarding Proto Bantu. So again, just cherry picking, contradicting himself. See, here he is. He doesn't agree with. Uh, the, there's little evidence that Bantu originates in Cameroon. Like, just keep on driving that point home. Page 103, Tep Resi, where Nubia and Kimi meet, just as Heneti uh, referred to Sudan, Nubia. I believe that Tepi, short for Tep Resi, also referred to this region. And it's from here that the Greeks got the term Ethiopia from. So, I mean, yeah, right here, I mean, I, I got it right here. Um, the Greek English lexicon, the origin of Ethiopia is it's, uh, Greek in origin. It's me, burnt face. All right, so page 110. All right, so this is um, a little interesting. So, so page 110 it says that Frederick P. Wicker in this text, Egypt and the Mountain of the Moon, provides us with a convincing hypothesis to as to the inspiration of the white crown. Um, it is indeed a weaver's nest, um, is what he's trying to say. And, you know, noted that, you know, we've never found a white crown or a red crown in that. So making that comparison is a little sketchy to begin with. And so he tried to say that the bird's nest is probably the inspiration for other white crown. And then he uses this specific weaver bird nest. And then, so if you know anything about weaver birds, um, each species make a, a unique uh, bird's nest. So when I looked up this particular weaver bird, its distribution is in the Indian subcontinent in Southeast Asia. So somebody want to say something? Okay, but yeah, so no, again, go ahead, Joshua. Go ahead. Okay, yeah, so again, like this is just a reach, like all together. Like, I mean, it doesn't even, it doesn't even resemble the white crown, if you ask me. Like, and Egypt, way over here, and India and South Asia, where this bird is found, is way over here. He could at least use a weaver bird found in Africa, try to make that claim. And right here, you can go down to the database right here. And they show you all the different weaver bird species and the different nests that they make. Um, all right, so right now we're going to want to define a term. Pigeon is a simplified version of some language, often augmented by features from other languages. A pigeon typically arises in colonial situations and is used at the beginning primarily as a trade language. All right, so 110, he says that the the H or the H type sounds is dropped in Yoruba or cognate terms in Kikam. For example, he tries to compare uh, Kikam Haseb to think and reckon with Yoruba Shebi to think and to suppose. So right here, I got the Afro-Asiatic um, cognates of Haseb and Ethio Semitic languages in Hebrew, Arabic, Coptic, and Egyptian. So let's look at Yoruba real quick. Um, they do have a word called Sebi to know, to understand, but this word is actually a Nigerian pig, uh, pigeon uh, language spoken uh, throughout Nigeria. 
It's based in English by way of Mediterranean uh, lingua franca words left over from the colonial period. In this case, the Portuguese. So, so right here, uh, look at picked in uh, Yoruba in Nigeria, spoken throughout Nigeria, by the way, not just Yoruba. Um, this word semi comes from the Portuguese. It doesn't come from Egypt, which he's tried to connect these two words, but upon further review, that's just not the case. So yeah, it's just poor methodology, poor research. Like it's a it's a pigeon a pigeon language uh, word. Like it's not even Egyptian based. So all right. So all right, so this is right here, page 122, 123. He tries to compare. Um, it constantly everything all right? Hello? Yes, uh, we're still on and okay. still recording. So okay. I think you're all right. I think we've been stepped out. Okay, all right, to make sure everything was cool. But uh, anyway, you know, page 122, 123, we know that both images contain a priest or king with a serpent emblem on their forehead. In Yoruba land, the snake on the forehead symbolizes uh, Ogboni, elder society. So right here, this is a, a brass Ife head, and he tries to compare it to a wall relief um, in Egypt from an Egyptian pharaoh. So he tried to say that this is a serpent at the top of this Ife head. But uh, if you look at the modern crowns of the Uni of Ife, um, you see that it's not a serpent at all. It's, it's made out of a bee, uh, Yoruba beads, actually. And it's not, again, it's not a snake. And um, to prove that, go on to the next slide. Okay, there we go. Also, if we look at um, West African art, uh -huh. as far back as as fifteenth century, very very descriptive. You know, West African art. If you look at the Ife statue, that is very abstract. So that's not uh, a a serpent. If it would be, it would be far more descriptive and look directly as a serpent. Okay. All right, so check this, uh, this, this video out. The beat in the crown mean that this was a very high personality. The crown was certainly a composite structure. It is possible that the base was cotton woven cup maybe in the style of what we see now. We have some photographs of that as well. And if you look at the top of the crown, you can see these elements which are beads. The beads were produced in Ileife uh, for a long period before the European came. And we know that they were making red tubular beads. And probably in the British Museum head, what you can find here, this painted in red, suggests the red tubular beads. The huge significance of beads in Ife society can be seen in another brass sculpture dug up at the same time as the head of Ife. It shows a half figure, again interpreted as an oni. He not only wears a beaded crown, but he's bedecked in intricate beaded regalia. All right. All right. Well, were y'all able to hear that? Yes, sir. That was a bomb right there. That was yeah, definitely perfect. That was lit. <laughs> right. Cool. So, I mean, <laughs> clearly that's not a snake and is made out of beads or whatnot. Like the, the, 
El Ife, uh, these and right here, these are uh, these are sources that you can look up. Um, one thousand year old colored glass beads discovered in West Africa from live science. You got a uh, uh, Frank Willett, um, Ife and its archaeology journal of African history. You got uh, the potential of digital representation, to changing the meaning of Ife bronzes from pre-colonial Ife and the Ife head uh, from the British Museum. And this is the link to this uh this video right here this is a uh a documentary on the ife heads um it's a pretty good uh little mini documentary you might want to go check it out so is that a serpent on top of his head no it's false it's pseudo straight up so um so page 129 he's trying to say that the collagen are important to our analysis because they are direct descendants of the ancient Kimitu from the Delta region. So he's saying they come from the Delta region. And that's a case of cherry picking because the Cal the Calagene have so many different uh uh or histories amongst themselves. So yeah, yeah, uh there's evidence that they um did inhabit uh parts of the, the Sudan. Um uh, using archaeology, but to say they came from the Delta region in Egypt, like you, you have to like show something to back that up, in which he does not. Um, all right, so then page 134, uh, he said the nature of the S root becomes more apparent when we consider Middle Egyptian terms. The root S survives in Kiswahili in reduplicate in, in the reduplicated form Sasa, meaning now. So what he's saying is that Sasa and Kiswahili came from Middle Egypt. And when you look at the word Sasa in Swahili, which is one of the worst languages to use as far as <laughs> historical Bantu, because Kiswahili has so much interaction with uh, Arabic speaking people. Um, right here from the Inca, the scholar's reflection on philosophy in Africa, we can note then here that the word Zaman signifies an Arabic epoch, uh, uh, era, period, time, while, while the word Sa, which is double in Sasa, signifies the moment, the instant, the time. And right here, Arabic loan words in East African languages through Swahili, you got Sa, and you see all the other various um, languages that Key Swahili had on other Bantu languages with the Arabic word sa or sasa. So no, it did not come from Egypt. It came from Arabic. And by doing that, you kind of prove <laughs> that uh you kind of made a a case for Afroasiatic because Arabic is Semitic, Afroasiatic, and um is related to Egyptian. So for the Arabic speakers to to come all the way over to South uh Africa and and plant a word that you thought came from Egypt that just shows the validity of Afro-Asiatic. That one little instance. So, so no, it's not an Egyptian word per se. It's by way of uh, Arabic-speaking people. So, no, incorrect. So here he, um, page 149 through uh, 150, he has a little chart here. He tries to make a connection um, with the word bit um, to mean honey. And he tries to compare it uh, with various African languages. So, change my pointer. Uh, so, okay, so first of all, this website right here at the bottom on the left, when I went to it, I did not see these words on the chart that was on this website. Uh, with this particular page, I had to go look for it on, um, it was on uh, www. Pit, uh, dot edu, but I had to go look for it. So, um, so it's like he kind of combined it to make it seem as if uh, this word bit was kind of like I guess related to uh, Mboti and Zambia, which is a, a Bantu, uh, a Bantu speaking place within Africa. So again, so. He says that this word bit, honey, is also found in many African languages, association with a drink known as honey wine. So we go to the next slide. Um, so 
this red circle right here is modern day uh, Zambia. Um, I pulled from the Bantu languages, uh, language trees reflect the spread of farming across sub-Saharan Africa. Um, so page seven, it says, there probably was horizontal transfer of the uh, early Iron, Iron Age technology from East Bantu speaking populations uh, in East Africa to both Central Bantu and West Savannah speaking populations. That's what it's saying. It was a lot of contact between uh, Eastern Bantu, Central Bantu, and Western Bantu. So, uh, and we, if we know something about um, the Eastern Bantu is that they had a lot of contact with Nala Saharan speak, uh, speaking people, Cushitic speaking uh, people around the Great Lake area in East Africa. So, and then again, um, Zambia, I pulled from, uh, what is the name? They have Bantu plants as indicators of linguistic stratigra uh, stratigraphic um, um, in the western province of Zambia. Uh, so, you know, again, it talks about the, the interaction between different uh, language groups. Uh, let me see. Yeah, the western province of Zambia appears to have attracted speech communities of very diverse historical origin. So, again, it's talking about migration patterns. Um, they're fairly recent, not historic, well, partly historic, but mainly this is talking about uh, fairly recent, uh, probably the colonial age um, in Africa. So, uh, but it, it also, also has been a melting a meeting point between early Bantu branches and old linguistic frontier between the East and East Bantu and Southwest Bantu uh, that runs into the Western province. and. All these distantly related language groups have already begun to integrate progressively into a common linguistic area, mutually affecting each other and undergoing the same external influences. So again, so this word uh, bit is what you know he's trying to say is connected to uh, Ethiopian languages, and he's trying to make a connection between Ethiopia and Egypt. Um, we go to the next slide. Again, it talks about what they call town bimba, uh, which is also in Zambia. And it's, you know, it represents a, a form of traditional Bantu languages, which having been brought as exogenous varieties to colonial contact settings. Uh, so again, it's talking about uh, the colonial period and the different, uh, the different interaction between different Bantu groups. Then of course you got a, uh, the Arabic slave trade. Um, one of the highways were was through um, Zambia, so you have a lot going on in Zambia. So this word beats. So going back to it. Uh, so in Proto Bantu, I use the uh, the Bantu lexical reconstruction three, which I reference later on. And show you the link where you can go look it up yourself. Um, you got the word for wine and beer, dogu, in Proto Bantu, and in other zones uh, across Africa, Sub Saharan Africa. Um, then you got Proto Bantu or B, which is, is uh, excuse me, um, Jiki, again, um, found in Proto Bantu and spread across Africa. And that's where you can find it at right here. Again, so honey, um, well, you got bee, you got wine, beer, and proto bantu is is uh, th this word in Boti is not present. So it means that that along the way, um, these people of Zambia picked the word up from somewhere else. So, and it may have been now Saharan speakers, might have been Cushitic speakers. But was it by way of Egypt, um, through Ethiopia and all that? Nah, they didn't come from Egypt with this word. Or um, I guess what he's trying to say, that it's uh, some sort of connection there. But again, it's, it's fairly recent. And from this book, uh, The Prehistory of the 73 Plus Bantu Languages and Language Groups of Zambia, um, 
pull from page 208. It's talk, it talks about the, the words in Zambia for, uh, you got honeycomb, sa, uh, sapa, uh, kinda, honeycomb cell, ana for B, larvae, um, and then it goes down to the proto Bantu words uh, like Oki and Uki, uh, Tana, or whatnot. So one thing that uh, that I noticed is uh, he failed to to uh, disambiguate like what exactly happened historically. Um, again, like I showed you, it was a lot of um, colonial contact, a lot of area contact a lot of migrations over the past two three hundred years and probably uh before then so it did this word in boti come from egypt no it did not like um i think it was uh with the evidence at hand i think it was like fairly recent and if you look at proto banter which is we talked about proto earlier proto meaning first and foremost and this word in boti is nowhere in uh proto bantu as far as honey wine or honey beer or whatever so again that suggests that they picked it up much later on in history so and i think yeah page 155 uh he tries to make a connection again uh with yoruba he tried to say that yoruba bale or Bale, father husband leader um is connected to um the kush the afro-asiatic uh bela uh bala and these words you see up here so again so when you talk about a word being a reflex you're saying that it's a form or feature that reflects or represents an earlier, often reconstructed form of a feature having undergone phonetic or other change. So, in order to reconstruct it, you have to um, go down to the root word. And when you look at the root word, well, the root words of Bali in Yoruba is actually uh, compound words, um, or what they call vowel assimilation for Oba and Ile, and you combine those two and that's how you get Bale. So this is incorrect, because this is the roots. These are root words. Yeah, that's that's how. Wow. Wow. Right. Yep, so these are roots at the top, and Bale, the root of Bale and Bell, what he's trying to make a, a connection to is actually Oba and Ile. And again, that's vowel simulation in Yoruba. So whenever, a word ends with a vowel, and the next word um, begins with a vowel, like most Yoruba words do. Uh, one vowel has to delete and take the form of the second, or the first vowel is retained, or you know, either or. So, no, that's not a cognate between uh, Afroasiatic or Eastern Cushitic or whatever he's trying to make the connection to. So, and uh. I reference uh, right here at the bottom. You got uh, Intermediate Yoruba. You can check it out on page 107. And you got the Grammar and Dictionary of the Yoruba, page four. You can check that out. So again, uses flawed methods and with uh, unrepeatable results. All right. So page uh, 160, 161. Okay, this is his... Um, uh, sound co correspondence chart. So he's saying right here, and when you see a W in Chikam, it corresponds with a B in Chaluba. We see, uh, I forgot the actual name of this, but whatever you see this, it equals to an N, and S equals to a Z in Chaluba, and you see S again, it equals to the J sign in Chaluba. So what I did was, um, I looked up um, these words, dominion, power, and chiluba. So, all right, cool. So, again, dominion and power right here in Chikam 
And when you go over here to the Chaluba word, right here, the, the Chaluba words for dominion and power is uh, bu, bu Kukeshi, Bu Kalanji, Bu Fumu, and Mona. Um, you got ruin, or what he tried to say, Waset. Um, you come over here to Chaluba, you got uh, Shikulu. Again, uh, let me see, go down to prosperous and fortunate over here in Chikam. And go over here to the Chiluba word for prosperous, fortunate, and prosperity is Mwabi. And the last one on the Chikam, citizen, uh, you got uh, Mwena Mwabo. So, yep. So there it is um, in Chiluba. So, all right, so let's go back over here to his chart. So, Again, what I did was I took these words in Chikam and defined them using the Chaluba dictionary, the same one that he uses. And I came up with different words, as you see, can see over here, for dominion, power, ruin, prosperous, fortunate, prosperity, citizen. You can see. So what about these words right here, like Banza? Um, let me zoom them out. All right, so Banza, from what I looked up, uh, go back. Baza does mean house, and M Baza means it is a, it's the plural form of house. So uh, all of these other words. Um, so with, with co sound correspondence, uh, that should be sound correspondence with these words too. And she come, which he doesn't show. If you say that this word. In both languages, has similar meaning. Um, so, those, and those words are related. It should have the same sound correspondences, and you can see upon further investigation that they don't. So, Banza does mean house. So, this word right here, Lu Banza. Uh, when I looked it up using the same dictionary and another dictionary too, um, I did not see re remains or ruins for Lu Banza. And then he says, six and, page 161, the Mbaza capital is the location of the chief's residency. And this is where he maintains order. And you look at capital in Chalubu, it's Siminga, Siminga Sikulus, Simingeminga, Tuni, and Impuilima Mambu. And it is not like, Mbaza is nowhere on there. Mbaza just means multiple houses. It's plural form of house, Banza. So, I don't know where he's getting that from. And here goes uh, another reach, um, 177, 178. He says, above we see the European king holding a staff. This is uh, Napoleon the first, by the way, sitting on his throne with a spotted robe. These are the same motives that are common across Africa, especially in ancient Kemet. Below we see motives among Zulu leaders. Here we see the king wearing spotted uh, leopard garments while holding his staff and even other headpieces that the other leaders are wearing similar to this uh is a borrowing from uh indo-european speakers as we can see the same motives among ancient Kemetic priests and kings thus suggesting a common african origin but then when you analyze uh, napoleon's uh robe uh napoleon actually chose a b as his personal family emblem so no this is not copying the leopard skin of these Zulu uh, kings over here is actually a B, and the symbol it, it symbolizes uh, immortality, regen regeneration, um, and he based it off of uh, uh, some some small gold and garnet beads that he had been found in 1653 when a tomb was opened of the fifth century king Shild Shildrick of uh, the first of France and father of Clovis, and thus by appropriating Childeric's uh, Childrick's bees, Napoleon was consciously connecting um, the house of Bonaparte with the ancient Moravian um, dynasty that created the sovereignty of France itself. So no, he didn't get it from, from Egypt or Africa. Like, I don't know where he got that from. And here's a picture of the bee right here. So no, this is not a leopard skin. This is not copied from Zulu warriors in Egypt. So that, that's a reach. All right, so again, we got another table of sound correspondence. So he's saying that whenever you see Ingo, 
in Chicago, you should see a B or M in, I guess, uh, Kemet. I guess it means Chicago or whatever he calls it. So, all right, so we look up a word um, in, in Gengo, very steep, height above Danvers Bank. And I looked up words in hieroglyphic dictionaries and I didn't find any any words that start with B or M, what they contain B or M. So same thing for moon, didn't see anything. Uh, you got in, in Gondo, squirrel, didn't see anything for that. Like So nope, those cyrocondas are not consistent that uh, that, that needs, well, that which requires uh, linguistic reconstruction. So now that's uh, it's a little pseudo. Um, then you got, uh, he says, Ibira, which spoken in N Nigeria. Um, whatever you see, and let me see. Whenever you see an H in Ibira, you should see an S in Hebrew. And look at the Ibira word, Ihi, Iha, uh, for home. And you look at the Hebrew word for it is, is Beth. Um, the word Uwo for knife. And you look at the words for knife in Hebrew, not the same. Uh, pillar of a house. You look at pillar of a house and a food, it's not the same. You should see an S according to his uh, sound correspondence that he established, and this is not tenable at all. So it's reaching. All right, page 193. Given that the Greek soter doesn't have, appear to have any Indo European etymology, an early loan from Egyptian sita seems plausible, and that's incorrect. You can go to the College of Liberal Arts of the University of Texas and go to Indo-European lexicon and Proto-Indo-European etymon and Indo-European reflexes. And you see the, the root word right here, um, to swell, uh, to grow. And you go down on that same very, that very same page, you got Hellenic, uh, you got Homeric, Greek, Greek, and they have uh, cognates within Indo-European. Um, root words, T-O and, and To and two O and two. So that's incorrect. It didn't come from Egypt. Page 197. Hey, Mel, you know what I'm saying? Just go ahead and get ready. Um, <laughs> page 197. The Luau is the ethnic group that is now, uh, that, not, that the now president of the United States of America belongs to, at least on his father's side. In 2009, President Obama visited Egypt uh, and visited the tomb of Ka in Cairo. There he saw the D2 hieroglyph, the D2 hieroglyph, and made the comment that looks like me. Look at those ears. Like, what's the point of even writing that in the book? All right, so another thing, any other time that he tries to uh, compare words or he cites words, he'll pull from a dictionary. But then there was a, a handful of times where he wouldn't cite from a dictionary. He'll use a, a testimonial a phone call conversation or he'll make up a word and this is the instance of him calling somebody to make up a word so um he tries to let me see an informant from this speech community informed me that the name osir means to lean on to lean and he called mr icon Maruko from kampala uganda for that word that what it meaning and then so right here so when something is stable and firm we say oh sir and something stands for uh it does not have to be physical a physical thing per se um used to describe deeds or actions like your words need to be firm and stable and this is a personal interview he did with maureen tonika akinye on september 17 2015 and I thought this was a scholar of some sort. I thought this was a linguist, and I looked her up, and I couldn't find her. But brother, um, brother Melvin knew of her, and this is uh, this is who she is. Um, she's part of the Session Medunetta group. Uh, so yes, a sorry motel. Uh, look for confirmation with somebody in Amara Squad under the assessment of another group. So that's where he got his proof of Osir, meaning to be stable. And no, I'm not accepting that. But I mean, because number one, she's not a, a scholar. I don't, 
I mean, I don't have anything else to 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 base that off of besides her word. So, and I've looked for that word too, and I just couldn't find it. So, hey, it's too much. If you want, to, I wanted to say something really quickly. Um, it's not necessarily that she doesn't. Um, she's not a scholar. It's just that he's using her uh, because she's from Nairobi, and she's he's using her word, you know, as a way to stand on with Osir, Osir, Osiris would mean in her language. But the problem with that, when you're doing preliminary research, is that you have to use somebody who who can necessarily represent their their culture and, and be the, the vocal point for those people. You don't just use anybody. You have to make sure that you use someone who is at least worthy enough to be accredited for the position. So this is why you would use a scholar or use a linguist or use a, a professional, you know, from the same place. So that way they can, when you ask them, hey, what does this word mean? You know, this is a specialist who studies, you know, for, for a living for his, his country. So now that comes into play. There's no sociopolitics. There's no, oh, because I'm from Nairobi, I can tell you what the Nairobi people say, just to make an agreement, agreeing with you or to disagree. Because you right. can't, can't detect motive or if someone is or isn't lying. But when you have a specialist in the field, from that location, now their profession and the integrity of their profession is on the line. And now what they say, especially in a publication where they're being sourced, matters. But we just reach out to anybody and especially somebody who's affiliated with you by, you know, affiliation of a, a team of our Mariah squad. Now it gets sketchy. Because now it's like, okay, who is this person? What is their credentials? Or are they just from the country? Like, like that's the thing that I'm like, okay, you know, I see where this is going. <laughs> and so, like, that's the whole thing. Not, it's not just because she's not a scholar. It's just because, you know, she, she's not necessarily somebody who's going to say, hey, I'm responsible for the full translation and understanding of the translation of the Nairobi language when it pertains to this particular word. When I would rather have, especially from doing research, I look for the profession. I look for those who are in the profession because they are being responsible for anything that gets interpreted and for anything that they say. So that's that's my piece. I want to make that you know clear, you know. Yeah, yeah, and um, and what was again, like I, like I said before, like any other time, he would reference a dictionary. And you can go straight to it and find the word, and it's sometimes still it's still reaching. But in this in these instances, he does not reference a dictionary. He has to reference somebody on his team. There's a who's polit politically uh, aligned to him. Um, and then again, so if she does say that, if you go look for the word and you still don't find it, that means there's some a little sketchy there. Something just ain't right. So right, and that that even makes her look bad and it makes him look even worse because it's like why not just go get a professional you know why not just go get a professional from Nairobi I'm pretty sure there are several languages in Nairobi that you can go look up or at least look up an organization there are plenty of linguistic organizations that can provide resources or answers for some of these things that you need so check this out on, on page 200 Again, uh, this is another example of of him not like engaging in the actual linguistic data, because any other time he's trying to make a case for a word, he pulls from a dictionary or you know Chalupa dictionary or uh, Kayla Jean uh, dictionary. Uh, so right here, he's just making. So he's saying that. Uh, Change my. Oh, my pointer. So again, so check this out. So you're trying to say that Razir um, Ankh it equals Mashul Anga, Mashul Life. So I looked up Ankh. I looked up Anga 
And um and it, like he he provides no source of this. And then when I looked up Anga down here, it means shine to look forward to be furious or how much in the high tone. So uh from what I my research, Anga does not mean life. It doesn't mean Mashul Anga. And again, he provided no source on this. No source whatsoever. So these words do not mean life because he didn't. Again, you, you can go to the Shaluba dictionary yourself and look up Anga and you will see the definition yourself. The same Chaluba dictionary that he uses throughout the book, but he chose not to use it this time. So All right, so page 202 uh, through 203. All right, so I, the reason why I'm kind of like highlighting this is the inconsistent um, and invalid logic. Basically, he's saying we are confirmed uh, in our, our hypothesis, not only by linguistic data, but from the primary accounts, the primary accounts in Greek records, for example. Theodorus Sicilus was a Greek historian who wrote about the monuments of history in oh, monuments of universal history in his Bibliotheca Historica. Many Egyptologists try to diminish the accounts of Theodorus as fanciful um, because they just can't accept his argument. But from the record of Theodorus, we also know that Cyrus was the leader of the colony, which implies kingship. So, all right. So if, if you refer back to this uh, presentation. Uh, he has a problem with the cops and um, Coptic language and script, mainly because they borrowed from the Greek. And he said stuff like, this would explain why the cops need to adopt Greek writing script and they did not have to. Uh, uh, he's saying that the originals did not have to borrow signs from foreign people. Uh, is my contention that the adoption of Greek signs is because the cops partly originated or identified with people from the regions of the Aegean or Mesopotamia. Basically, he's trying to downplay the cops' role or their ties to Egypt because they had to interact or use Greek or Greeks for a script or what you have. Or he tried to say that they have more connection to Mesopotamia or or the, or the Greeks. So, but it's okay for him to use Diodora Sicilis, which is a, he's a, he's a poor source anyway, when we talk about pre dynastic times and the origin of this or the origin of that, because uh, many Egyptologists are summing up. Uh, he's an inept compiler of the Augustan uh, era. He was not the man to carefully scrutinize the written records of the priests of Egypt. Um, caution is mandatory with Diodora Sicilis. Um, Diodorus uh, is a poor source in the role of the monarch in late in, in the last Egyptian dynasty. So, like overall, he's a poor source. This depends on what you're doing. Now, if you're talking about pre-dynastic times, like he's a very poor source in the origin of Osiris. <laughs> but again, it's okay for him to pull from Greeks, but it's not okay for the cops over here to pull a writing script from Greeks which he kind of like try to shun them like they're not Egyptian because they have to use people from Mesopotamia and the GNC and all this other whatnot, you know. So it's inconsistent logic. So would you like to chime in on using Diodorus as a as a uh, reliable source, source in, this con in this context? Well, for him to, it, the contradiction with that is just the, uh, the cultural aspects of the Greeks and Diodorus himself. If we look at the daily life, lives of those Greeks, when we study history, we have to study culture. And Diodorus was not necessarily inclined to understand ancient Egyptian from a so-called Negro Egyptian or um, black, if we wanna say, black Egyptian perspective, as if the Egyptians were conscious of their own skin color relating to their culture. Uh, they were continental people. Uh, Diodorus at best could only describe them, but would not have the ability to even give way to this type of interpretation, which is clearly Afrocentric. 
And I don't think Diodorus was Afrocentric or, or even um, open to Afrocentricity in pre-dynastic Kemet, if I'm making any sense here. The American social construct, Pan-Africanism and, a- and Afrocentrism was not present at that time. There was no need for it globally. So it would be a poor source just based on cultural reference. There's no cognate for Diodorus to have an opinion on it, in my opinion. And I, and I, I would tend to agree. Um, me personally, if I was writing a book, I would not pull Diodorus for the origin of Osiris. Like it's too far off in history for, no. for, for him to, you know what I'm saying? So. And, I, and now remember, Brother Josh, even with the origin of Osiris, we're talking about within context of the title of this book, which is Nasut Biti. And Nasut mm-hmm. Biti alludes to the Egyptians being a certain type of Egyptian. These Kimiti people that are being used by a fellow uh, linguist of his, uh, Wajawu, all in that construct. It's all indicative of Jean-Claude Mboli, Diophile Obenga, and Sheikh Anta Jop in dealing with the black dynastic theory. All of this stuff is cognate. Osari Motel obviously is drawing from those parameters. So again, how do we fit Diodorus into that when they vehemently denounce any activity or friendship with any Greeks? According to Osari Motel, there was no Greek involvement in Kemet. Of course, we know that's different. We do know that that's not true. However, I digress that there is no there is no logic that is consistent with even pulling a source from that person not for this subject matter unless you have an agenda and you <laughs> tend to cherry pick only like favorable sources if somebody's saying something that aligns with your paradigm aligns with your agenda of course you're going to pull this one little brief little sentence but you're going to disagree with every other thing this person says which is which is it's just not scientific it's not scholarly at all this is not what scholars do we don't cherry pick one sentence in one instance where somebody lines up with what we say and just totally disagree with every other thing this person says especially when you have an agenda again at uh at the root so yep all right uh, page 223, 225. We come to find out that the inspiration of this glyph comes from Rabanala plant in Africa, which is called in Kalijian Sasur Yet. This tree plant is native to Madagascar. So he's saying that this glyph, this audiogram uh, for, uh, for the, the parasail, meaning suit or, or excuse me, shoot or shade, is, is inspired by this Rabanala plant. That's indigenous to Madagascar now. Uh, doesn't take much to figure out that Madagascar is a very long way from ancient Egypt. And how in the world did this Ravenala plant get to Egypt and the Egyptians saw it and were inspired by it? And even the, the parasol itself is not necessarily a plant. It could be ostrich feathers. It, it can be made out, out of a number of uh, materials. So. It's a reach. Then again, the inconsistencies um, uh, come to find out that the inspiration of this glyph comes from the Ravanala plant in Africa, which uh, the Kalajian Caesarea comes from. And here he goes. Any other time, he references uh, the Kalajian dictionary. But when we come to Ravanala, which is not in there, he has to call Dr. Kip Ko- Koich Arap Sambu, who provided me with the name of this plant in Kalajian. I still have yet to find this word uh, for Rabanala. Um, and here we go again, like, you know, cherry picking favorable evidence and relying on weak testimonials. So again, to just to illustrate what I'm talking about, like Egypt's way up here. Not saying that they can't trade with people down here, but how did this plant that's native to Madagascar and Southeast Africa, who, what, when, where, how, like, How's that even like possible? And two, if I mean, 
I'm just trying to. Okay, so right here, uh, the the Kim and two traveled far that far south and probably in pre dynastic times to do trade. So he's saying they the the Egyptians traveled far south is right here to do trade. I guess was what he's saying. Um, it probably. Let me see. Evidence for their continued trade can be found along the east coast of Africa. It is probably from this pre-dynastic trade that this tree and plant was introduced in the Sesame of Nettum. But again, like this is East Africa, this is South Africa. This is what the plant grows at. So again, I think he's just reaching. All right, so more inconsistent logic. Um, page two, 23, he said the word Saruyet has the same consonant sequence as S35 hieroglyphs, C, uh, S, Y, R, T. So he accepts this because it has, has the same consonant sequence, but he rejects on page 215 that Wazir is Berber, as the phonemes do not match when they do match. The consonants match, and consonants. Um, but phonemes represent consonants. So you accept one because they had the same consonant sequence, but you reject the other one, which had the same consonant sequence. So it's just inconsistent logic. Uh, uh, all right, so again, uh, 229, a continent for Mustang on two legs, form, form and meaning. So we look at the word, Hebrew word, Bilal, um, means mixing. Uh, mingle, confuse, confound. All right, he just said that a continent must stand on two legs, form and meaning. So if you go down here, if you look up in Chichua Bantu, uh, you look up scatter, you don't see balalalala anywhere. Uh, you look at disperse, um, it's one, uh, the, the second definition is li ba, I, you know, I'm not gonna say that, but. Uh, it's not the same as Hebrew, uh, Hebrew Bilal. It doesn't have the same form or meaning. So again, flawed methods, unrepeatable results, not the same thing at all. And, all right, so this is, uh, this is a chart from this, this guy from the last presentation, um, A.M. Lam, who tried to c connect Pular um, to or Pula or Falani of West Africa to cognates from Egypt. And again, like I said last time, I pulled Gabar Takax. Um, he says that Gabar Takax is an expert and he's a reliable source. And Gabar Takax says that this Pular and Egyptian connection is absurd, untenable, irreal, irreal, uh, rejected, and false. So. I already dealt with that on the first presentation. I'm not going into that again, but yeah, it's just pseudo. Um, 255, uh, so as a result of convergence along the Nile Valley by many different Negro Egyptian speakers, um, many sound changes and borrowings made their way into the Chicon and that were historically the same, but each term having found specific use within the language. So. This is a brief uh, synopsis of Negro Egyptian, Yoruba, Ch uh, Chiluba, Congo, Zulu, Zande, Somali, Shango, et cetera, et cetera. So this is what he's saying that all these, uh, well, most of these languages were on, along the Nile and they influenced Chikam, is what he's saying. Again, no time frame, no archaeology, nothing to back it up, just a lot of reaching. And I kind of like illustrated what these different language groups are. Uh, you got. Uh, let me see. You got Congo, you got Egyptian, Haiban, Zandi. These are the languages that he's saying are, that are one branch, the Beer branch, the Biri branch of um, uh, Egyptian, uh, Negro Egyptian. And this is a second branch. And all of these, are, like he's saying, are connected to Egypt somehow. All right, 279. Uh, so when you're dealing with uh, Linguistic reconstructions, you're supposed to compare the, the, the base of a word, or if you compare uh, the morphology of a word, that, that's okay too. But in this instance, he's saying that the root Arabic uh, dakara or dakara to mention is 
cognate to with uh, the Yoruba word Daruko, meaning to mention or to mention name of. But when you break down the roots of Daruko, it's not the RK, it's actually a prefix. Um, uh, the word da, and, and then you add in Oruko means name. So when you have two words in Yoruba, they, um, one ends with a vowel and one begins with a vowel, and you combine them together, you either delete a, a vowel, you retain a vowel, or they assimilate together. And this is the case of assimilation. And it means Daruko. So no, the roots of Daruko is not DRK. That's not the root. All right, so page 296, 297. All right, he's trying to make a case that the Middle Egyptian, Shin, uh, and K KNG sound value, uh, it had the same uh, sound value. So he says that we hypothesized the very word king in English and Shin and Middle Egyptian derives from the same root word with Shin being palatalized. And this may allow us for for, for us to speculate for a moment, an African origin of the word king. So we look at, uh, okay, and then he says, king and Proto-Germanic, if our associations are correct and they are not correct, because Middle Egyptian right here in this area, you know, uh, Middle Egyptian was spoken between, you know, estimated 2000 and 1300 uh, BCE. Uh, Proto-Germanic, according to linguists, um, in the European uh, ling uh, linguists, they say that it's unlikely to be spoken more than 2,500 uh, years ago. It's, um, yeah, it's unlikely. So, And this is the spot of the Proto-Germanic homeland. So what he's saying is that the Egyptians walked up here and gave them the word for, for king. And again, this is just an instance, or this is an example why you just cannot use linguistics by itself. See, this is the Proto-Germanic homeland, way over here. This is Egypt, way down here. So at what point did the Egyptians and the Germans interact for Middle Egyptian speakers to give them the word Shin, and they develop it to Kuningas, or King in Proto-Germanic? And of course, he doesn't have anything to substantiate that, so it's a reach. And then um, page 302, the role <laughs> The role and function of ancient comedic centers of wisdom can be understood by examining a similar institution in a related language. Uh, in this case, the Mandi of West Africa. So he's saying that the Mandi of West Africa are uh, related to um, the ancient Egyptian language. So I pull from um, two sources on Proto Mandi, and Proto Mandi uh, was most likely. Uh, spoken around um, the fourth millennium in southern Sahara in West Africa. Um, this hypothesis is supported through an analysis of the cultural vocabulary that can be presumably, presumably be reconstructed for the proto mandi languages. So it has nothing to do with Egypt, the proto language. And again, when we talk about the prefix proto, we mean the first and foremost. So before proto mandi there was no Mandi language. So how do you connect that with Egypt? Thousands of miles away across the Sahara. So that's another reach. So on page 26 uh, in the suit beating, um, Newman, given these statements above, would consider emboldening one of those empirically based languages who holds the position that languages should be treated as unrelated unless otherwise proved by the comparative method. So this right here is the basis uh, and the foundation of their methodology. They treat languages as unrelated totally unrelated and they quote paul newman well he quotes paul newman but if we actually read what paul newman said in african languages the job of the comparative linguist is to provide the best explanation possible consistent with the facts in proposing a classification it is not necessary that the linguist prove that the classification is absolutely certain by the presentation of conclusive evidence at various times by irresponsible scholars many careful Empirically based linguists jumped to the opposite extreme and took the position that all languages should be treated as unrelated unless until proved otherwise. This, this was thought to be a prudent scientific requirement. However, on closer inspection, this requirement turns out to be untenable 
and not in keeping with the standard scientific procedure. So right, so right there in um in his own book, like they basically cut itself as far as their methodology because treating all languages as they're unrelated is totally unscientific according to the source that you you name. So and I'm going to show you an example why because chance overlap and sound meaning I referenced this before. Um, it basically talks about how, for example, all languages have a low vowel sound, such as the A sound, an I, and a U. Most languages have a T, a K, a P, an N, and an M sound. And so, given that, you look at the phonologies of different languages, like Sumerian consonants, Hittite consonants, um, Amharic consonants, Georgian uh, uh, ph phonemic uh, uh, consonants, and uh, Shango consonants. Like most languages, again, like you just said, has a T, K, M, N sounds or whatnot. So just by doing that, like um, you, you can find uh, similarities in, in any language just by treating treating those languages as they're unrelated. And in this case, take Hausa and German, for example. If we were using their methodology, um, we can compare Libe and Lip, Lipe uh, for lip. Uh, the word for hand is Hanu in Hausa and hand in German, it means hand, and Karf, Karfi and Kraft for strength. Um, so just by using their methodology, we can see that, hey, maybe Hausa and German might be connected. But upon further review, the, the larger your sample size, which is another key thing in the science, um, and scientific method, your sample, your sample size should be at least adequate. It has to be large enough for you to test it across uh, these two, three thousand words within these given languages. And you just you compare two or three words and say, "Hey, we, we got a match." That's not how it works. So, if you go on to compare other words in Hausa and German, like body is jiki in Hausa and corpor in um, in German. And drink is sha in Hausa and trinken in German. Two is bu in Hausa and zewe in in um in German. So right there, that shows you why you should not treat languages as they're unrelated, totally unrelated, and then uh try to do these uh, pseudo linguistic reconstructions unless uh. Some some things have already been established, or they are in the same geographical region. So th this is this was uh, a good one. He says that the on three twenty four and three twenty five, he says that the word reg in Proto Indo European has Negro Egyptian origins. So the languages that he uses, uh, he uses Kikongo. He uses Chiluba and Kikuyu. And he said these three languages gave birth to Proto-Indo-European way up here in the in the Caspian uh in the, the Pontic regions of uh Europe and uh, Asia. So again, so Kikongo is a descendant of Proto Bantu, 2000 BC roughly estimated. Uh, Chiluba is attested probably in the first century, uh, common era, and Kikuyu probably the 16th century. And these are the sources. This is for Chiluba, this is for Kikuyu, this is for Proto Indo European, and this is for Chicago. So, how in the world did these uh, three language groups or languages of Bantu influence Proto Indo European way up here? This is based on archaeology. This is based on genetics also. The R1A and R1B splitting somewhere around here in this area. In the, in the, in the, uh, the steep uh, region of uh, Eurasia. And if you uh, refer back to page eight and nine, and what he says, he says, concerning relationships between cultures that exist in our region, geographical spaces in vastly different time periods, we must not confuse relationships with parallels and parallels with origins. If I'm not mistaken, this is not only a far-reaching geographical 
um, space, proto Indo European homeland, and Chaluba, Kikago, and um, Kikuyu. But this is vastly different time periods, especially for Kikuyu and Chaluba. This occurred 4,000 plus years afterwards, based on archaeology, based on genetics, based on glottochronology. So, again, the Sudbidi would have to prove, like, prove that these people interacted with these people and gave them the proto word reg to move in a straight line to rule to chartless which don't use linguistics by itself again is extremely hypothetical it's look it looks real nice but once you start pulling archaeology you start pulling anthropology you start pulling genetics and you see people have no contact whatsoever course uh the colonial period but all right that's it for that one all right so so again like with these uh when, when i started to um like look at all of the African um, linguistic reconstructions by Afrocentrists, I started to notice a pattern. And so let's just look at it right here. So, I mean, all languages in Africa are related to Egyptian. For some reason, I don't know why they try to make that connection. So, Dia or Giap in, in the game. Try to connect wall. Guy named Bully um, in the Democratic Republic. Luba in South And of course, the Sar. Just his old Negro just and family. And he says that they were birthed to Proto Semitic and Proto Indo European. So we talking about. All of Southern Highway Africa, uh, the Sahel region, Central, and all Semitic languages and Proto Indo European can come from Egypt, according to them. But again, so if we're talking about Wolof and Santa Gambia come from Egypt, and Boli um, said, you know, Zadi comes from the uh, Democratic of uh, Congo, and Chaluba. And all the other, these other languages. Remember what he said on page eight and nine is that uh, unnecessary conclusions concerning relationships between cultures that exist in far-reaching geographical spaces in vastly different time periods. It does not confuse relationships with parallels and origins. Like I'm trying to figure out, like, did you take your own advice? Because if you look at this this model beginning from ground zero with, with Diop and Obinga later on but you see the you see the 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 pattern here is that every single african language well most of the Af these african linguists tries to connect their language to egypt for some reason so you're saying that you, that the chaluba people didn't come from the congo you're saying that the, the zani people didn't come or originate in the congo you're saying that uh the wolof people didn't originate in the sahel in West Africa and Senegambia, Gambia, somewhere around here, like they have to come from Egypt. Like I don't understand it. And it uh, seems it seems like politically driven, maybe emotionally, because their culture is not good enough. And, and I don't know, they try to connect themselves to Egypt, probably to build their heritage up or to try to have some type of self esteem about themselves. I don't know. But so, um, like going over the whole book. Okay, if you remember, he disagrees emphatically with Proto Bantu being in West Africa. But however, he uses Proto Bantu 30 plus times. And um, each source that he pulls for Proto Bantu uh, has Proto Bantu in West Africa, like especially the Bantu lexical reconstruction on um, three. He pulls from that, he pulls from um, Christopher Eric and some other scholars. 
But I mean, but you disagree with. I, I don't understand why you pull from people that you disagree with, or people that disagree with you. So that's another thing I noticed about the book. And then here we go. We got a chart or of people or scholars that the suit be the uses whose stance totally contradicts or disagrees with Negro Egyptian chin and into family altogether. You got Sokita with the timeline, migrations, Afro-Asiatic, James P. Allen, Egyptian languages, uh, language phases, old, middle, late, uh, Coptic, Afro-Asiatic language group, Paul Newman, Afro-Asiatic, and the comparator method, um, Christopher Eric, you got Antonio Lepriano, Gabar Cox, uh, G. Tucker Childs, Hesmond Satzinger, um, their nurse, um, oh yeah, he used the Tower of Babel World, World Language Database, and he pulled from Afro-Asiatic, he pulled from um, now Chicago, Bantu, and Proto-Indo-European, but the Tower of Babel agrees with the current uh, consensus of what these languages originated from, based on the current knowledge. But he pulled from it. It didn't stop him from pulling from it. Then you got a bodily combo methodology. He still has used some of his information. Um, the, again, the Bantu lexical reconstruction. Uh, Andrew Kitchen, uh, anthropology. So it just, the list goes on and on. So next slide. Now, me personally, um, reading this book, would I cite myself? so many times if i were an expert if i was the only scholar within my field i would have no choice to but when you talk about african languages you talk about linguistics ancient egyptian it's, it's a plethora of, uh, of of information out here and for you to be uh referencing yourself citing yourself over 30 plus times and you have six references uh within this book uh the passion of the christ or passion of osiris the congo origins of jesus myth by sorry motel you got uh let me see towards the method for vocalizing metanoda symbols but the bacala of north america um and, I, and all these other uh texts or I guess uh, books or articles by him. And he references, you know, this six times uh, within, his, within his reference list. And again, so we check this out from self-citation by researchers, narcissism or an inevitable outcome of a cohesive sustained research program. So there are certainly instances where self-citation would be considered problematic. The potential for egregious self-citation exist authors that go out their way to cite their own work um and i've seen that repeatedly throughout the book of the you know going out your way to cite or reference your work and over here from chicago guide to communicating science uh, they talk about the circumstances when where an author cites his or own her own work fairly often or perhaps very very often as well as colleagues too. So self-citation includes the, the author himself and colleagues, in this case, in bullying. Um, referencing your own work too often, say more than 20% of the time, or stacking your reference list with your own articles, maybe five or six out of 30 or 40 total will produce an image of professionalism. Um, wow. Yep. <laughs> so, so even with self-citation, not only can it be yourself, uh, Kansu, it can be your colleague from a particular school of thought, or, you know, so we talk about him citing Mboli. Check this out. Wow. Huh? When does it stop? It's gonna stop, you know, we're gonna hit the jackpot, you know. <laughs> Incredible. Yep. Incredible. And did it over 90 plus times. Wow. In Boldly. Just, I mean, that's what I'm saying. So we combine in Boldly and, and uh, Asar's um, citations within this text over 120 times, at least. 
Interesting relationship. Wow. Is, is, I, that's I, not... I wonder how many linguists are citing in Boli outside of Assad. Um, below low, maybe. <laughs> that's about it. <laughs> that, that's that's all I know. Yeah. So collectively between Osari Motep and John Claude and Boley within the Subiti, probably over I know at least 120, 130 plus times collectively. So uh check this out. However, self citation may also be inappropriate, excessive, unbalanced, promoting one particular view. Uh, Negro Egyptian and the work of one author or team or school of thought inbred, promoting one or more connected people in Bali, uh, misleading and distorting. Erroneous theories and beliefs can be propagated by citation networks that emphasizes uh, statements that are clearly wrong or be, even being refuted by empirical evidence. Uh, like Diop and Obinga have been refuted in the past. So uh, here we go right now in 2017, this Negro edition stuff is still alive. So refuted claims continue to be heavily cited once entrenched in the literature, uh, i.e. the soup Beatty and, um, and Bowley's work. In, excuse me, um, in this regard, the different variants of self-citation can be surrogates of a deeper and more troubling potential distortion of the scientific literature. And that comes from a generalized view of self-citation, direct co-author, collaborative, and coercive induced self-citation in the Journal of Psychosomatic Research, Volume 7 and 8, this, uh, Issue 1. <sighs> so is Nasut Bidi a pseudo book? All right. Well, that about sums it up, man. That was an excellent, excellent presentation, um, Brother Joshua. Um, very, very concise. Um, I see that you took the time to cross-reference. And um, you came with your own opinions in certain areas, but it was based on um, deductive reasoning, based on what was inducted, which showed, in my opinion, a flawed methodology of research, um, which induced us to kind of deduce uh, his methodology. And we know that inductive, deductive, and abductive reasoning are elements that must be used in research. Um, what's your opinion on his methodology as you, um, you know, gave a great presentation, man? What's your opinion on that? Yeah, um, it, it was flawed from the beginning. Um, like, you check out, uh, let me see where it go back. Uh, we called it Paul Newman. Um, mm -hmm. And Paul Newman blatantly said that um, authors took the extreme. Um, they took the extreme. This is right here. They took the extreme approach from from methodology uh, of a uh, of a uh, treating languages like they should be unrelated and trying to do comparative method that way and. He clearly said that this was thought to be a prudent scientific requirement, but he said it, it wasn't. And uh, Asar goes on to say that and, uh, Newman would consider Mboli and himself a one of those empirically sound uh, scholars or linguists, and this is not true. He was saying that, okay, they took one side and w with the with the uh, with the language classifications and the other people took a an extreme side to that. And he was talking about people like Osar and Mboli as far as treating all languages as unrelated, which is ridiculous because most languages um, have a, a T sound, a K, a P, a M, a N, uh, a short A sound. So that methodology was, was, was dead at, at, at the root. Uh, it was poor methodology. Um, you you wanted to expound on that or add something to it? No, you know, you pretty much summed it up. You pretty much summed it up, man. You made it abundantly clear. I couldn't have said it any better. Uh, we don't want anyone to think this is a personal attack. It's not. Um, we deal with scholarship from a general aspect. But we also know that when we see flawed methodology and quite, quite naturally, 
personally, in my opinion, um, because uh, I've just watched this person publish books after books. I just think it's a personal agenda. Well, I could be wrong. I'm not, not an expert on, can't read his mind and his intent. But I will say that there are a lot of personal uh, cognates throughout his works that just show that it's something uh, that is not genuine in the work that he does. And he oh, no. has a tendency to be a bit arrogant speaking against him, but that's not, that's not the motivation of this uh, subject matter. That's just my personal opinion. Well, that, that's, that's not only your personal opinion, but um, going by the, uh, what, what he's shown is he's been challenged in the past. Now, I have, I have not been aware of most of those challenges until like lately, like uh, with uh, Dr. Combone in uh, Ghana. But the, uh, the, the, one, one of the telltale signs of a pseudo uh, science scientists is uh their willingness to to accept criticism their unwavering stance regardless of how much information you show them they show them that their, their, their methodology is flawed their premise is flawed their information is outdated they still hold on to these um these beliefs at the end of the day so they're unwavering if mm -hmm. you look at uh this chart right here science and pseudoscience they start with the conclusion what is the what is the conclusion is that the egyptians were black they're hostile to criticism you've seen that i've seen that they yeah. use vague jargon to confuse and invade uh mm -hmm. make grandiose claims they go beyond the evidence and that it's it like this these migration patterns and these people interacting that uh were not even around each other they were not even quote unquote people at the same time period uh, that's a grandiose plan that go, goes beyond evidence. Cherry picking, he did plenty of that. And I showed that he cherry picked so many sources and references, uh, uses flawed methods of repeatable results. Lone Mavericks working in isolation. Who Who is that? That would be Mboli, that would be Asar, and that would be Bilolo. Nobody knows these guys exist, but within their circle, they are the king of the hill what have you they they are the authoritative rule within their circle and they do that to people that they don't know any better and that's also uh highlighted over here and the guy to the perplexed they, they feed off the ignorance of the reader the, the 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 layman reader um they also use inconsistent logic and they're very dog dogmatic and unyielding so overall um I don't know. What would be. Did you have something else before I continue? No, you, just, you just put the nail in the coffin, man. I, when you said dogmatic and unyielding, that's exactly the description. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, like. Well, I'm, I'm going to say this. Um, it's kind of hard. Uh, you know, we've had some really powerful eras in our history. And one powerful era was those mid-'80s to uh, late 90s for some of us because of the influence of the Afrocentric boom. After the advent of Egyptomania from European, you had certain um, scholars, Ivan Van Zerdema, um, uh, Dr. Claude Anderson, not Dr. Claude Anderson, I'm sorry, John Henry Clark, um, Dr. Ben Yalkinen, mm -hmm. um, Sheikh Jop. Mm -hmm. uh, these people, uh, George Jim James, to name a few, these people were very influential to the Pan-African Afrocentric movement in the, during the advent of Stokely Carmichael, who be, later became Kwame Ture. These things made us feel good. They galvanized the Black Power movement. It gave us a sense of... Um, belonging and superiority because culturally we are misappropriated as African-Americans. The slave narrative has been misrepresented and has been told properly. So um, me being around the same age, a little bit older than Asar, um, I know that it's hard to let go 
a lot of these scholars. Uh, they've done their work. Um, I dare not disrespect any of them. I appreciate them and respect them a great deal. But, you know, time and technology, along with science, changes things. So what was prevalent will not always be. And we have to be open-minded to change. And it's very hard to let go a lot of the feel-good stuff because they were such great pragmatic speakers. And they had some really great innovative things for their time. I don't believe any of those elders were malicious. I believe the misrepresentation of the elders is a malicious thing because you deify the people and put them in, put them in uh, a false sense of uh, identity. So I just think that Brother Asar needs to reevaluate and be most critical of his own information. I think that's what's needed. Mm -hmm. All right, Brother Joshua, that was excellent, man. Um, excellent, excellent presentation on the situation involving um, Asai Motep's uh, book. I believe your screen, it just went black and went to end screen, but um, I just want you to give some closing statements on this particular book. Uh, obviously, you got problems with it based on the presentation, but just give us some closing remarks. Um, yeah, so overall, um, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a lot of reaching, uh, misrepresented theories, um, cherry picking, a lot, a lot of false cognates, like uh, Brother Heru uh, mentioned. Um, uh, virtually, like, uh, it's a lot of jumbled uh, historical timelines all together. Uh, no archaeology used. It's just standalone linguistics. It's not even good linguistics at, at that. And then he represents himself like over 30 times. So it's almost, I don't know, like this whole entire book, I mean, uh, uh, he needs to go back to the drawing board with this one, like, this is like um it, it was difficult to read um because his thoughts were not concise it, it was all over the place it was a lot of inconsistencies uh like, like for instance semitic and egyptian is not related but negro egyptian which egyptian is a part of uh gave birth to proto-semitic but semitic and egyptian not related so that makes no sense like it's just a number of inconsistent thoughts uh premises Write this whole entire book. So, uh, one out of ten. Um, ten being the, the, the good, and one being eh. I, I give it a two. Like, I mean, <laughs> you know, and I'm and I'm being nice by giving him a two because I like the cover. You know, the cover was pretty straight. <laughs> but, but the book overall is, is a bunch of. <laughs> Overall, it's a bunch of BS. Like, I, I, I want to find one person. I want anybody out there that read this book in its entirety, and you understood everything he said in its entirety. <laughs> I want you to email me on Facebook. Inbox me, please. Uh, I'm trying not to laugh. <laughs> I'm just saying, like, one person. I, I just want one person that has read the suit bitty in its entirety to inbox me and tell me what you took from it and how did you understand it? Because I didn't understand anything he was saying. So... Those are my closing remarks. Um, uh, what's next? We, we got uh, me and brother Melvin, um, and now uh, brother um, brother Mike Cozy, uh, new team member of Team Osiris. Um, we're going to go in on in Bowley's work next. So be on the lookout for that. Oh, Mike Cozy will be pretty pretty deadly because he understands French very well. Uh oh. Yes. Very well. Blowing. Very. We talk a lot. Me and Mike talk a lot, so he knows. He's, a, he's an official biological more. So that's gonna be fun. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> well, you know, with that, yeah, that's what they have, man. I I, I want to ask this last question. Um, does uh, a Siamo tap just need to stop? Should he? Should he? Should he just stop producing literary? Oh, uh, uh, first he needs to apologize for writing this book. That's number one. Um, <laughs> after, an, 
after he apologizes, then it's either go back to the drawing board and kind of like uh kind of like reevaluate your stance, come up with some better evidence, or just stop altogether. But this is just awful. Like using <laughs> like using uh stolen legacy, George M. James, using oh yeah, I forgot to mention he used like books from like eighteen hundreds, like outdated uh Egypt Egyptology books. Uh Sumerian Bantu lexicon, nineteen twelve, like it's outdated. So yes. Uh, I would suggest that either, like I said, apologize, go back to the drawing board, just stop. Because this is just, this is all, this is just one book. And, and a book that he recommended that I read, so. I totally agree with you, brother. You know, I appreciate this work. Um, great investigative work, very consistent and concise. And once again, man, it's another chapter in Timo Services, you know, work and log book, man. Everybody come and join us, timosiris.com. To apologize. Okay, I'm back, guys. Sorry about that, okay. everybody. Okay. Um, just some technical difficulties. And like I said, everybody visit us at www.timosiris.com. Visit us on Facebook. As well, Timo, Timo Cyrus. Also, you can visit us um, on YouTube, Timo Cyrus. So you can visit us in uh, many, many different ways. And come check out our information, man. But that's a real good job, brother. I appreciate your time. And everybody out there, peace and power. I, I didn't see it there. So...